We are Mighty, the miniature tether electrodynamics experiment team, and today presenting on our group's research will be Lauren Sikowski, Maya Pandya, Mitch Miller, and myself, Jesse Patterson. So we'll start with a brief overview of what we are studying and why we believe our research is important. Uh, then we'll move into the overall objective of our, of our team and the goals for each of our two planned missions, Mighty One and Mighty Two. And finally, we'll talk about the specifics of each of our individual subsystems and what aspects of our missions each is in charge of. Um, so since electrodynamic tethers are a little bit more of a niche topic, it's important that we begin by giving a general overview of what they are and how they work. Um, so an electrodynamic tether is just a wire that connects two different spacecraft, and they're typically just a few meters long, but they've actually been um, several um, kilometers long in a few missions. Um, so when the tether is functioning, there's a current that runs through the wire, and when that current interacts with Earth's magnetic field, there's a force generated on the wire that um, propels the two satellites. And this force, um, which is called the Lorentz force, is the same general phenomenon that you see acting in electric motors. Um, and then one more important thing to note is uh, that you can't just have a regular circuit loop between the two satellites because then you'll get current running in two opposite directions and the forces will just cancel out. Um, so in our mission, we have one satellite um, that's biased that collects electrons from the space plasma and then the electrons are emitted out the top of the other through a cathode, and that's basically how we keep a one-way current running. Um, so there are several reasons why using electrodynamic tethers could be beneficial for space missions. Um, so the first is that this method of propulsion doesn't require any propellant, um, which means that it doesn't take up as much mass or volume in a satellite. And because of that, it can be used to counteract the small amount of atmospheric drag that you experience in space, and it can increase mission lifetimes. Uh, second, propellantless propulsion can be used to create picosat and femtosat formations by repeated maneuvering of individual satellites. Um, third, electrodynamic tethers can prevent spacecraft tumbling and make orienting spacecraft easier. And that's basically because um, the two different satellites are at two different orbital altitudes, which is gonna cause their orbital periods to be different. Um, and so you end up with a differential and the um, placement of the two different satellites. And that basically forces the tether between the two to remain taut and keep them at a fixed orientation to one another. Um, and then finally, these tethers can be used to harvest electrical energy from an orbit. Um, if you're not powering them, the electromotive force that's induced by Earth's magnetic field can be used to um, generate power and that power can be used to help um, the formation deorbit. Um, and now I'll pass it off to Mitch Miller to talk about our objectives and future missions. All right, thank you, Jesse. So to talk about our objective, the main thing that we are trying to do is raise the technology readiness level or TRL of these electrodynamic tethers in CubeSats. Now these EDTs have been flown before in traditional satellites, traditional larger satellites, but their main focus has been in power generation. That's because with larger traditional satellites, you're going to have a much greater surface area to mass ratio as compared to CubeSat. So using them as a propulsive force is not practical in large satellites. However, now that we see the space market is starting to churn towards smaller satellites for their benefits, we can start to use these EDTs as a propulsive force. So that's what our goal is, is to really be one of the first teams to put this tether concept on a CubeSat so future missions can use it as a reliable propulsive system. So in order to raise it, there's two key things that we need to understand about this tethered satellite uh, system. First thing is the electrodynamics of the EDT tether. So this involves understanding the plasma dynamics of the ionosphere and our current collection capabilities that we can do uh, in situ in uh, the ionosphere. One big thing that we need to keep in mind is understanding how these physical parameters change depending on where we are relative to the Earth, whether it's a high lat or low lat, or if we're on the day side or night side of Earth. We're expecting the plasma environment to be different and the uh, current collection capabilities of our satellite to be different. So we need to be able to study that and understand it. 
The other thing that we need to know with the uh, electrodynamics is the propulsive force that we're actually able to generate. So obviously you want to be using these tethers as a propulsion system. So we need to be able to understand uh, the amount of thrust we're able to get and if that's able to be greater than the aerodynamic drag force that we're experiencing on the satellite. The other second main objective that we need to know is the mechanical dynamics of the EDP system. So one of the big things is, is when we're deploying uh, from a CubeSat deployment down to a 10 to 30 meter long tether below the main body satellite, we're in a zero G environment. So we need to be able to guarantee that that tether can become taut over time uh, and not have any major vibrations in it or oscillations. So we have a stable system. So as Jesse also said previously, this is where gravity gradient forces also come into play uh, quite a lot. So that is the main things that we need to really understand to be able to raise the TRL. And to be able to accomplish this, we have two dedicated satellite missions, Mighty 1 and Mighty 2. So if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so Mighty 1 is our first satellite, and this is our proving ground mission and preliminary science mission. So we have two main components that we're really flying and testing on this mission. The first one is our Langmuir probe, which you can kind of see is sticking up out top of the satellite near the antennas. What that Langmuir probe or LP is doing is it's really measuring the ion density of the ionosphere, the plasma density. So what this is going to do is it's going to really help us tell, tell us what the uh, physical parameters and properties are of the ionosphere and that our current collection capabilities of the satellite. The second main thing is you can see below the satellite, we have this one meter long rigid boom. At the bottom of that, we have a, about a smartphone size PicoSat that we're going to be collecting uh, electrons from the ionosphere, channeling them up through that boom and then uh, expulsing them out of the main body. So we're doing this so we can really measure exactly how much current we're able to collect with this PicoSat design. So moving on to next slide. So Mighty One, we're nearing the end of our development phase. So this is our satellite built up, looking at the inside with one of our uh, solar panels taken off. So we're going to talk about the different subsystems we have in this later. But uh, this is just kind of to show you what the inside guts of the satellite look like. We're operating on a 3U satellite bus. So that's a 10 by 10 by 30 centimeter large uh, satellite. And uh, okay, yeah, we should also say we're scheduled to launch for Mighty One uh, later this summer. So we're coming up and we're excited to get that data. Now, our second mission, Mighty Two, is going to be building upon this data that we collect from Mighty One to inform our design of uh, the physical parameters associated with the uh, tether and how it's going to influence that. So with our science measurements from the LP and the current collection capabilities, that's going to really tell us how our EDT system, which we're going to fully implement in this satellite, is going to function. So from this, we're expecting to really uh, improve our knowledge about how these EDTs can be a viable propulsive system uh, on CubeSats. And we're right now in the preliminary design phase of Mighty2. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren, where she's going to start to talk about some of our subsystems more in depth. Thanks, Mitch. So um, Mighty is broken up into six different subsystems that split up the work. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is command and data handling. Their main goal is to handle um, the spacecraft control, task ex execution, and the error management for all of the various subsystems programs. So they accomplish this through using a hub and spoke architecture, which is broken down in the bottom picture on the right hand side. And they also use the incorporation of multiple multiprocessors like the MSP shown in the top photo. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. So the next subsystem that we have is communications. Their main responsibility is to both design and also implement the architecture that allows Mighty and the ground station to be able to, to be able to communicate back and forth with each other. 
So the picture on the left shows a breakdown of the communication architecture. Um, additionally, the subsystem also operates and maintains the ground station facilities in the building that we conduct our research out of, which is the Climate and Space Research Building. And um, the photo on the right shows some of their testing being conducted in an anechoic chamber, which allows for them to conduct testing that doesn't have reflections or ambient radio signals that are interfere with their data collection. Um, and the next slide, please. So the third subsystem that we have is the electrical power systems. They're concerned with all things that deal with power. Um, this includes creating methods for generating, storing, conditioning, and also distributing power to all of the onboard systems, which can be seen in the photo on the right, so all of those different boards within MITEI. Um, other work they do includes characterizing, refining the primary distribution board, designing and characterizing solar panels that have their own embedded circuitry, and also developing high voltage converters for biosing our anode and cathode systems. So I'll pass it off to Maya to discuss the last three remaining subsystems of MITEI. Thanks, Lauren. So our next subsystem is the Orbit's Attitude Determination and Control System subteam, also known as OADCS. OADCS is responsible for designing, testing, and integrating the hardware and software that determines the satellite orientations and rotation rate. On MITEI-1, we developed the BDOT algorithm that uses the IMU to check rotation rate and then uses the change in magnetic field to send current through the magnet torquers to slow down the satellite's rotation rate. We also use photodiodes to determine the attitude of the spacecraft. MITEI-2 will be more complex since now the rotation rate will have to be stabilized even with the 10 to 30 meter tether. So the photo on the bottom shows a basic model of the OADCS board with the IMU magnet torquers and magnetometers. So now I'm gonna move on to our next subsystem, which is plasma. So this team designs the plasma electrodynamic system and this maintains the current flowing through the electrodynamic tether for MITEI-2 and has instruments to characterize the ambient plasma around the spacecraft. Um, as was mentioned before, the Langmuir probe, shown in the bottom right picture, um, character, um, is deployed on the top of the main body, and it's used to measure the ambient plasma characteristics before and after thrusting. The high voltage power supply biases the picosat width, um, which is surrounded by plasma, and it causes the electrons in the plasma to be attracted to it. And this, um, these things together help us measure the plasma characteristics. So on the top right corner is a photo of the inside of the picosat. The final subsystem we will be talk about today is the structure subsystem. The structure subsystem designs, tests, and constructs the structural mechanisms of the CubeSat. They are the ones that basically tie everything together. They're responsible for the antenna deployment of the CubeSat, which uses the burn release mechanisms. So the photos on the right show the antennas tied down to the sides of the spacecraft before they are deployed. And then the bottom right picture shows the antennas deployed. Um, the photos, um, so then, um, they are also responsible for the Langmuir probe and boom deployment systems, as shown again in the right. The deployment systems use spring release mechanisms for MITEI-1. Tether deployment for MITEI-2 is still in the process of being designed. It is a very multidisciplinary challenge that will require all subteams to work closely together to create a design that will fit everything. So that concludes our presentation for day, today. Thank you so much for everyone for listening. And at this time, feel free to ask any questions. All right, yeah, that was, that was great. Um, I think we have a question in the chat already. Um, let's see, it says, have any other antenna designs been considered such as hel helical, patch, or parabolic antenna? One second. Yeah, so, um, one second. I think Mitch is muted. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. can you guys start to hear me again now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we, unfortunately, we don't have anyone from our communication subsystem on today, but I can say uh, for 
Mighty 2, now that we're in the preliminary design phase, the we're trying to really keep our antenna similar because we want to build upon our heritage with Mighty 1. And also we have to kind of comply with the antenna systems that we have in place on the roof of the Space Research Building. Uh, so right now we're still just considering that uh, tape measure style uh, antenna system with, uh, I believe, where you have a circular polarization. Okay, it looks like we have another question. So what are some challenges you have to consider when designing a tethered system that you didn't have to worry about for Mighty One. So some some challenges um, are, for example, instead of a one meter boom, we're gonna have a 10 to 30 meter tether and that's gonna complicate a lot of the dynamics and um, as well as like communication between the PicoSat and the main body and stuff like that. So to kind of like uh, build on that, uh, the main challenges that we have is that with Mighty One, we're on a fixed boom system. So we know that our, uh, basically it's a second independent satellite, this PicoSat that we have. We know that its orientation relative to our main body satellite is going to be pretty much identical just because it's a fixed system. Now, what happens with Mighty 2 when we extend that from a one meter long boom to a 30 meter long non-rigid tether is that we have no real idea of knowing what that end body satellite is doing. So this really puts a lot of stress on our ADCS subsystem, especially for Mighty 2, uh, because it's going to make us have to really put a uh, ADCS system onto our end body as well as our main body and our main body is going to have to have a much more robust ADCS subsystem to be able to really get us uh, the right attitude that we need to be a stable system. The other big challenge is that uh, our tether, it's only a few uh, microns thick, so we can't really put in any communication lines into that. So we have to have a completely wireless uh, communication system between our PicoSat and our main body, whereas for Mighty One, we have uh, dedicated communication lines with that in physical hardware, so it's much more easy to communicate back and forth. So those are some big design challenges that we're facing for uh, moving into Mighty Two. Okay. 